Welcome, everyone. It's very nice to meet you all, and thanks for being here today. Uh, so before we get started, we're just going to go through some housekeeping um, items. Um, so first of all, the recording will be available. Uh, it will be sent to you shortly after the event alongside with a survey. Uh, the survey is just to help us um, provide, uh, for you to provide some feedback for us and for us to use that um, for our next events. Uh, so we ask that you do um, fill out the survey just for, for our knowledge. Um, we also ask that you submit your questions through the Zoom Q&A. This will help us organize all the questions that we get. You also have the option to upvote the questions. So uh, if you see a question that you like and you'd like that question to be answered, you can upvote that question. Um, and then finally, all participants are automatically muted. So we do ask that, like I said before, if you have a question to please ask it on the Zoom Q&A. And if you have a comment or if you'd like to introduce yourself, uh, please do so through uh, the Zoom chat. And the next slide, please. So the objective for today's event is to help guide you on what skills and approaches can best prepare you to thrive in and contribute to the current COVID-19 climate, as well as the post-COVID-19 inclusive recovery. And the next slide, please. Uh, so just before we get started, uh, just to run through the agenda. So first, we're going to be doing the introduction, which is what we're doing now. Uh, next, uh, one of our panelists, Yasmin, is going to run us through the E2030 uh, project overview. This will then be followed by the panel discussion, uh, which will then be followed by the Q&A. And then finally, we will have a networking session. Um, this is open to everyone and it is optional. However, we do highly encourage you to participate. It will be lots of fun. You'll get to meet a lot of people. So uh, if you have the time, we'd love to, to see you there. And I'll pass it now to Siwa. Yes, thanks, Gabi. Hi, everyone. I'm Siyuha. I'm a policy intern at the Berkfeld Institute, one of today's host organizations. Before we begin, I would like to give the land acknowledgement on behalf of the Business and Higher Education Roundtable and the Berkfeld Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. We do this as a symbolic restorative act, one among many to follow, part of a wider and hopefully transformative reconciliation effort. We recognize and respectfully acknowledge that Bihar's main office is located on unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe Nation. We extend our respect to all First Nations, Inuit, and Native peoples for their valuable past and present contributions to this land. In addition, Ryerson is on the territory of the Anishinaabe, the Shawnee, and the Huron Wendat. It is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty, Treaty No. 13, and the Williams Treaties. We also recognize that this is a virtual event and that many of you are joining us from other locations and invite you to take a moment and consider your own relationship and commitment to the land and the treaties that cover it. I will now turn to introducing the partners involved in putting together today's event. The Brookfield Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship is an independent and nonpartisan policy institute. We're small but mighty, a team of 24. We exist to advance innovation policies, which is essentially policies related to the innovation economy, including future skills, the use and adoption of AI, and the economic environment needed to scale companies. We don't just study, we also do, which is what makes us different from a lot of other organizations. We run pilots to test our ideas in real life. And finally, we're a young team, constantly learning from each other and problem solving together. I've only been here for a summer, but so far it's been a great place to work. On behalf of my organization and our event planning committee, I want to thank you all for joining us today and I'm going to pass, pass things over to Brianna from Bihar. Awesome, thanks Siwa. So my name is Brianna. I am Associate Communications at the Business Higher Education Roundtable, or BHER for short. I'm one of the partners putting on today's webinar. Uh, so just a little bit about the Business Higher Education Roundtable. We are a nonpartisan, not-for-profit organization, um, a membership-based organization that brings together some of Canada's largest companies and leading post-secondary institutions. Uh, since 2015, we've been working to harness the strengths of both the business and post-secondary education sectors in Canada, um, boost innovation 
and drive collaboration. So one of our primary objectives right now is working to create more work integrated learning opportunities across Canada, uh, but we do work in a number of areas related to these cross sectoral issues between business and post secondary education. And so with that, it's now my great pleasure to transition into introducing our moderator for today's discussion to get us started. Uh, so Hormuz Dadaboy is currently the Director of Operations at Beher. Um, in this role, he's responsible for leading Beher's overall strategy and our corporate development. Uh, but similar to many of the experiences of the panelists that we'll be hearing from today, um, Hormuz's career path has been anything but linear. He went from studying history and public policy uh, to working in consulting. Um, he then went on to do a master's degree in public policy. And after this, he worked in venture capital for RBC um, and with the Aga Khan Foundation Canada. He holds a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Toronto and a master's degree from Oxford University. And I, for one, am very much looking forward to hearing his conversation um, with our lineup of incredible panelists today. So without further ado, over to you, Hormuz. Thank you so much, Brianna, and uh, welcome to everyone uh, tuning in today. Uh, really looking forward to the discussion. So what I'm going to do now is just uh, introduce today's panelists. We have a real, uh, very, very interesting group of people, very diverse group of people today. Um, first off, we have Yasmin Rajabi, who's the project manager at the Brookfield Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And we've got Justin Wiebe, who's a program partner at the MasterCard Foundation. We have Anna K. Russell, a public affairs manager at Wood Green Community Services. We have Aikena Agua Menchi, digital strategy and strategic com communications at the Treasury Board Secretariat. And we have Victoria Kuketz, who is the partnership liaison at the Public Policy Forum. So without further ado, as Gabby mentioned earlier, I'm gonna pass it over to Yasmin, who's gonna share the key takeaways from Brookfield's employment in 2030 research on the future of work. So the idea is that this will provide us uh, a good overview of, um, of topics for our conversation today. So with that, with that, Yasmin, over to you. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Great, thank you so much, Harmuz. Um, and I'm so delighted to be here today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm going to dive right in just because it's a 140 page research report um, and it's almost two years it took us to uh, put it together. So uh, lots of information there and I'm going to try really hard to kind of condense everything to something that's um, digestible. So the reason why we kind of started our this employment in 2030 research project is because we saw that labor markets are changing rapidly. And um, whether that's digitalization or um, uh, automation impacting work, um, and we really need to know where we're heading in the next few years so that we're not just being reactive to these changes, but we're also an investing resources and skills training ahead of time so that workers are prepared. Um, and we're bringing them along with us, right? And especially with all of this change, um, oftentimes people first think of automation as the biggest change that's going to happen. And while it is like a, a quite significant, uh, in our research, we also like to point out to other trends in Canada's labor market that are going to be quite substantially um, impacting employment. And this includes like resource scarcity and climate change as a whole, right? When we think about Alberta and the political climate um, has changed so much in the past few years in regards to um, resource scarcity as well as climate change or the fact of how um, our population is aging, right? And how maybe that is also impacting our immigration policies as well. So there's lots of changes happening in the labor market. And right now we're also seeing that there's an appetite from not only governments, but the private sector as well to invest in building the resiliency of workers. So with all of these um, kind of things to keep in mind, we set out on a multi-year research project where we explored how specific occupations and skills are likely to change in the next 10 to 15 years. And our approach, um, we used a unique combination of strategic foresight research to identify 31 trends that are going to impact the labor market. Um, and we went across the country, met with over 120 experts across Canada and um, asked them specifically how they think that that may change. And we used um, their information as the, uh, the training data for our machine learning algorithm that could take their answers um, and project it across all of our um, all, almost 500 occupations in Canada. Um, and so we have those very granular information, how specific occupations may either increase or decrease in demand. And we were able to do this um, work because of our funders, um, which includes the Government of Canada and the Maxwell Foundation, as well as our, our phenomenal partnerships that we built across Canada. 
Um, and I'm just going to dive right into our findings because we don't have a lot of time here. Um, so our research findings show that a third of Canadians are currently in occupations projected to change in the next decade. And that kind of breaks down into 19% of workers are in, are in an occupation projected to grow. And um, the jobs that are projected to grow are often in health and science, as well as those who require a high degree of service orientation or technical expertise. So this, um, just thinking about that, so that's, um, we find, because we do projections for almost 500 occupations, we see that nurses, um, chefs, uh, graphic designers are some of the jobs that are in our top 10 growing jobs. And then on the other hand, we see that 15% of workers are in occupations projected to decline. And these tend to be focused um, mostly around resource extraction jobs or very manual jobs that um, require a lot of uh, physical manual labor. Um, so this is in manufacturing, um, certain agriculture sectors, as well as some trades. And if you want any more granular data, if, if you're interested in either your occupation and how that may change or, um, or looking into getting into a particular job, you can actually go to our website and um, type in the job classification and see how it does. So in addition to just seeing how the labor market as a whole is going to look like, we actually did a demographic analysis as well. Because I, I think we had a hypothesis that all of this change is not going to impact everyone, right? Some of this change is going to be concentrated in certain sectors or certain demographic groups or certain regions. And we found that to be true. Um, risks, resilience, and opportunities are unevenly distributed across peoples, uh, across Canada's peoples and regions. And I, I think this really points to the fact that we need targeted investments that recognize that um, not everyone has uh, access to the same kind of opportunities, right? And that um, there's different risks and, and opportunities for folks, and, and we need to take that into account when we are making investments, when we are creating um, programs um, as well. So I'm just going to give you, um, ooh, I'm getting a time check here. Um, so just a quick few um, details around our demographic analysis is that we see that men are projected to experience more job risk as well as greater opportunity. Um, and we find with women that they are less likely to um, experience, uh, they're experiencing fewer risks. Um, but also, um, they are experiencing far less opportunities as well. And what's kind of concerning here is that we see that while um, those women who are in occupations that are projected to decline, um, there's less of them than there are men, um, they may be particularly vulnerable to change because they get paid significantly less as well. Um, and then and when it comes to um, uh, workers with higher education and those with higher incomes, we, um, our results are that if you have higher education and higher income, you're likely to be in a growing job. And that is kind of really aligns with the larger literature around this. And um, I'm going to chat about Indigenous peoples and, um, as well. Um, and I'd like to shout out Justin, one of our panelists, who also um, was a reviewer on our research report and gave us valuable feedback. Um, so there's a lot of issues with the way that labor market information is collected from Indigenous people. Um, so it's, it's quite limited, but the data we do have shows us that among all workers um, across the country, Indigenous peoples are some of the most likely to be employed in occupations to decrease and least likely to be in growing occupations. Um, so this is really concerning and, and it's not, we don't live in a vacuum. Some of us know that and understand that there's a lot of factors of, of why Indigenous people are in, um, less likely to do economically as well. And a lot of it has to do with structural oppression, oppression and, and racism as well. And in our research report, we point to um, uh, investing in Indigenous-led initiatives in terms of skills um, training and programs as well. And then when it comes to visible minority workers, um, visible minorities are not a monolith. I, you can't brush the paint brush across and say that everyone's gonna do the same. We find that some uh, visible minority groups will tend to do really well. And then um, notably for men who identify as Filipino, Southeast Asian, Black or Latin American, over a quarter are in occupations projected to shrink, which is um, a quarter is, is, is quite significant. And I, I think, again, points to the need for us to act now while we still have time. And then um, this last part of our research is about the skills component, right? And this is really what's driving our entire forecast and our entire research. Um, so we looked at all the skills composition of all the jobs that are growing, and we found that five skills emerge as foundational across the labor market. So that's instruction, persuasion, service orientation, brainstorming, and memorization. 
Um, and they're deemed foundational because while they don't, because it's unlikely that an occupation um, is going to be growing if, if it doesn't um, have, it doesn't use those five skills. And the first thing you kind of notice is that out of those uh, three, um, out of those five skills, three of them are social skills. So instruction is your ability to teach or coach other people. Persuasion refers to your um, skill in changing other people's minds or behavior. Service orientation is how um, skilled you are in actively looking for ways to help people. And the remaining two are cognitive abilities, which is memorization, um, which is kind of like general information recall and we get a lot of questions around this one because it's not very intuitive for people so um for example if you're programming you do need to know a programming programming language for example right or if you're a nurse um you have to be able to recall um certain procedures um through memorizing them right and then um the last one is fluency of ideas which is um representing your ability to brainstorm and uh, together, all of these abilities and skills highlight um, kind of a longstanding debate that's been happening in education of whether or not we should be focusing on um, teaching creativity and thinking outside of the box or uh, knowledge retention. And, and I think what our model and our research really suggests is that it's not mutually exclusive, but rather that both abilities um, are needed. And we need workers that are really well-rounded. Um, so that was a, <laughs> a brief <laughs> summary of, of our of research. Um, and it's very high level what I chatted about today. If you'd like to learn more information and see how um, particular occupations may change, please go to our website and um, you can find out more. Um, I think that's it for me. I'm going to hand it back to you, Hermos, to, to start with the panel. Perfect. Thank you so much, Yasmin. It, it is really a fascinating report. I would encourage all of you to give it a read. I think it was sent out in the invites yesterday. So um, it's there for you to read. And this kind of longitudinal study is really important, especially I wish I had some sort of insight like that when I was starting out in my career, I probably wouldn't have changed parts many times as I did had I had that. Uh, but I'd like to kick it off with some panelist questions now. Um, and Yasmin, if, if it's good, I'd like to start with you. And I'm wondering, based on your research in skills and, and, and putting together this report, um, how have you used some of these foundational skills that came out in the E2030 in your career? And if I may just add, we're all dealing with this COVID context and how has COVID highlighted, impacted, maybe validated some of the, some of the findings that you, that you talked about in the E2030? Uh, for sure. And for most of those questions, I can go on forever, but I'm just going to try to keep it um, brief. So yes, I've thank definitely you. used all five skills and abilities in my career so far. Um, but I think what's really important for me to know, especially given the theme of this um, webinar today, is that um, it's not just my skills that I'm bringing to my job. I'm also bringing my entire self, and that means all of my experiences and everything um, in my identity as well, right? I don't leave that at the front door of my office, right? I bring that in with me. And then I think that's particularly important to keep in mind in the policy world where we see so much of our senior leadership is still not reflective of, does not reflect diverse communities, um, particularly people that they write policies for. So I'm gonna give an example of when I use some of these skills and, and it draws on my personal experience um, of when I started out my career five years ago. Um, so I worked with community organizations in Scarborough and growing up, I had experienced, um, I, was, I, I lived in poverty and experienced a lot of food insecurity growing up. And um, when I was growing up in Scarborough and as I got older and I really started my career um, and I was working with um, young people in particular, I, I kind of, I began to recognize the symptoms of hunger around me, right? Um, it's not always easy to kind of be able to sit down and, and focus for five hours when you're hungry, when you've missed lunch and um, breakfast, you may not have dinner, right? Um, I think it's oftentimes it's easy to say, oh, maybe they're not a good student, but there's also lots of structural issues there that we need to address. So um, as a part of my experience, um, I helped found a food bank um, in uh, Scarborough, in the East Scarborough community in particular. And some of the skills I, I really used was service orientation itself, right? Like I had that desire to help other people around me and that kind of was driving why I was trying to do my work in the first place, right? And then the kind of the second skill that I really used um, throughout that experience um, was persuasion also. It took two years to negotiate with um, a community partner to be able to get space for the food bank, right? Um, that's a very long time, but persuasion there was like a really valuable skill set. Um, and I definitely honed that skill as a part of those two years that it took to convince. 
And then just um, um, another example was instruction, like managing staff itself. Um, you're oftentimes um, not likely to be in a more senior role if, if um, you don't have the ability to instruct other people, right? Particularly as new staff are coming on and you want to be able to teach them um, how to do certain uh, procedures or operations. Um, so that's uh, how I use some of the skills and abilities in a, an example from my life. And, and I really want to reiterate to people that your lived experiences are so valuable, what you come from and where you come from and who you are. And I, I want to tell people, um, there's still a lot of, for us to address in our policy community when it comes to structural racism and oppression um, and other forms of oppression as well. But um, I want us to feel more comfortable coming into our work with our full self, right? And I know that's not easy all the time, but um, I, I think we do create much more richer policy discussions when we do. That's really fantastic. And I think what fantastic advice uh, to bring your full self to work and bring all of that experience with you and that passion with you into, into what you do. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was fantastic. I want to just turn it over to Justin. And um, Justin had a very interesting career path. So Justin, you started out as a teacher and then you transitioned to work in community and urban planning. And then you moved into philanthropy with the MasterCard Foundation. So talk to us a little bit about what drove these career shifts and what made you be successful at them. Awesome, thanks. Tanse everyone, Justin Natsiga-san, Machip Nap Yaunia, Saskatoon Otsinia. As folks had said, my name's Justin. I'm a, I'm a Métis guy from, uh, from Saskatchewan. Uh, always, uh, always showing off uh, how beautiful the prairies are in, the, in my virtual background. Uh, mostly just so you don't see how messy my bedroom is. Um, but yeah, I've, I've sort of been able to uh, transition a few times. And I mean, on, on, honestly speaking on one level, uh, I was just searching for work that I found fulfilling and, um, and wanting to earn a, uh, earn a living, you know, where I could uh, provide on, uh, for myself and, you know, for my family on, on a basic level. But um, what started out as, you know, teaching for me was, was so much about um, and on all of this ties back to the, to the skills and, and the, the work that, uh, Yasmin had shared. So, um, but for me, teaching was very much about giving back to my community. It was very much about, um, helping to ensure young people saw people that they could relate to. Uh, and I think particularly as a, as a, you know, indigenous man to, to see men, uh, in those sorts of positions, which is, which is one that's not um, often the case. But I realized very quickly that uh, even if I was, you know, the most amazing teacher in the world, I wasn't, but even if I was, uh, you know, I could impact a, a handful of kids a year. And that mattered and that was important. You know, I have many teachers, uh, people in my life who are teachers today. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm in awe and, of the work and, and, and the things that they do every day to inspire, uh, to support and to really save lives, you know, a lot of times. Um, but I got really interested in seeing that no matter how good I was, uh, kids would be coming into the classroom uh, with the same issues, the same challenges year after year. And I'm not talking about the sort of like typical teenager issues, you know, going through puberty and falling in love for the 12th time when you're 14 years old. Uh, I'm talking about the sort of systemic level stuff that was, was inflicted on people, particularly indigenous folks, folks of color, uh, that was outside of our control. You know, it was, the, it was the poverty that people were experiencing, the food insecurity. Um, it was these systemic issues that um, as good as I could be, as a teacher, I could, I could barely scratch the surface of those things. So I got deeply interested in sort of the systems that were at play around us. And um, that triggered me to sort of think about planning and, and think about the urban environment where I felt I could uh, make an impact on that sort of systems level, uh, but one that was still felt on the ground. You know, I didn't want to be, get so high up and so far from, from the people. I wanted to make sure the work I was doing still sort of connected uh, and that people could feel the impact of that work. And then sort of, honestly, I stumbled into philanthropy. I didn't know what it was uh, before I landed a job in it. Um, but but I, I've come to really see philanthropy as another tool uh, to really resource communities directly um, to, to make the change and to build uh, prosperous and vibrant communities aligned to their vision. So um, I think more importantly tied to this conversation, you know, thinking about the transition across these careers. It's so much about, you know, I, I've been able to do it largely because of the skills that, that Yasmin had shared, right? Um, a lot of these things I, I honed and built early on in my career, you know, as an educator, as a, you know, teacher, uh, one who was committed to, to sort of, you know, facilitation and learning, sharing, um, one that was, you know, deeply about, continue to be about critical thinking, brainstorming, you know, ideas, um, one about listening, right, listening and, and recognizing the gaps in my own understanding and, and surrounding myself with folks who know more and to connect and, and really hear that. Um, and lastly, that piece about a deep commitment to, to ongoing growth. And learning. So for me, it's sort of, it's been that commitment and that reflection 
that's enabled me to to transition um, you know relatively successfully across careers that on the surface feel probably really far apart from each other uh, but for me the skills I draw on are the same skills regardless of any of those three careers it's uh, that's great perspective uh, Justin I think you're right transferable skills are, are you know disparate career paths oftentimes are more related than than one might think when you're not in them uh, thanks for sharing that perspective. That was fantastic. Um, I want to turn it to Ikenna. Um, <clears throat> so Ikenna, you've been able to turn a passion for creative work, such as experience in media, marketing, and advertising into a career. What advice would you give to anyone looking to do the same? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. And uh, you know, thank you for, thank everyone for joining us today. Um, you know, in, in my career, you know, I've had to, I've had to pivot from time to time, and that's natural, you know, as a as University of Windsor alum, I, I studied at a little hub of creative chaos uh, called the Detroit Film Center. So, so when I burst, when I finally was able to burst out of the institutional bubble, you know, uh, as, as a young, as a young uh, recent grad, you know, I was under the impression that I was fully formed and ready for a career in film and television uh, as a creative. Um, so, uh, you know, what I, I think I soon realized that not only was there more to, uh, more to it than utilizing what I learned in school, I also realized that I wanted to do more than just, you know, like write scripts and direct. You know, I felt that there were more tangible skills that I can pick up um, from a more practical perspective. Um, and, you know, having, having studied not only film, but, you know, communications and media, uh, I saw opportunities for growth. Um, on the strategic side of, of media, and I wanted to influence the landscape um, on a larger scale. And that's, that's when I began to pivot. Um, and uh, I pivoted all the way into government uh, because I felt I could affect change on a different level. Um, also because, you know, the television industry, you know, uh, especially if, you're, if you have a young family, it's, you know, certain things can be a little destabilizing. So I had to look out for, for my family as well, right? Um, now, you know, I'm still learning, you know, as, as Justin mentioned, you know, the, you know, this constant growth and, and learning that has to be uh, accepted, you know, you have to be willing to accept the fact that, you know, you don't know everything. And that was part of the, uh, as part of the, ha having that ability to pivot and evolve, you know, years back, I saw value in, um, you know, adding podcasting to our media portfolio. Uh, in our team. And that required learning on my part, you know, because I had, I, I was, you know, I, I was, you know, trained with a completely different medium because it was, uh, you know, it was very different from the visual medium. But, you know, it, I had to do it in order to evolve, you know. So pivoting happens, you know, or whether you want to call it pivoting or, or transition, um, you know, it's, it's a skill unto itself. And it's one of those skills that needs to be layered on top of another skill uh, in order to be effective. You know, I'm, I'm comfortable with discomfort, you know, and I feel like that's a very, that's a very effective skill to have. If there's one piece of advice that I would give to anyone that they can take away, it's being cognizant of the fact that you should be comfortable with discomfort because not everything's going to be handed to you on a silver platter. Um, you know, some of us come from uh, backgrounds in which we were, you know, we didn't have, there was no privilege. You know, so we had to fight and claw for things. Um, and that will come with being in uncomfortable situations. Um, you know, but it's, you know, you know, some of that, some of that is fear of the unknown, you know, but the unknown, it's only fearful if I, I perceive it that way. You know, it's mind over matter, as they say. Um, they also say it's easier said than done. So I accept that. Uh, so if I view the unknown as, as something exciting, uh, now it becomes a little easier to embrace, and and that's been the found foundation of my dexterity, you know, in my career, um, you know, being able to look back with some of the people that I started out with, who are still working in television, and they're looking at me like you're doing <laughs> digital strategy and engagement at <laughs> in the Treasury Board of Secretariat. Who would have thunk? Who would have thunk it? Um, you know, but it's because of that dexterity, and I and I was able to dive into an area that uh, otherwise would have been, uh, you know, uncomfortable with. Um, and I recognize the transferable skills within myself, leading, you know, teams earlier on in my career, and how that can benefit me in leading a larger, leading in a larger capacity in a more traditional environment with very different priorities, uh, like policy and programs and inclusion and diversity, which is where I'm at right now. Uh, and that's allowed me to expand my horizons. You know, I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago. 
you know, some of my personal and professional interests have evolved and that can affect your career path as well. So if you've equipped yourself with the right tools, the, uh, the trajectory of your career can run parallel with the person you ultimately become. And that allows you to bring your whole self to work as Yasmin had, uh, had mentioned earlier. Um, you know, because I believe it is very important to be authentic um, because I feel it, uh, it, it's, um, you know, it, it can translate into the work that you bring and put forth. So. It's super. I think uh, being comfortable with being uncomfortable and just understanding that the only constant is that there will be constant change. I think that's, that, that will serve people very well. That, that's really well put. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I, kinda, I wanted to turn it over now to, to Anna Kay. This is an interesting one because Anna Kay, you're three weeks into a new job that you landed during a pandemic. So my first question is, what does job hunting look like during a pandemic when you can't do a lot of the traditional things you would do to try and get a job? And also, you now work at Wood Green, and you co-founded the Black Policy Network. So can you tell us a little bit more about these two organizations and your role in them? Sure. Um, so yeah, uh, still hasn't quite hit me yet that I did, in fact, find employment in the middle of a pandemic, but very happy about that. And to anyone that's watching right now um, that is job searching, I totally understand what you're going through and where you're at. And um, fully relate to your experience. Um, so in terms of job searching in a pandemic, I honestly kind of took a lot of uh, the similar approaches that I've been doing with previous job search um, periods of, you know, using internet database searches, um, relying heavily on my network, you know, connecting with people and just letting them know out in the open, I'm looking for a job. If you find anything, pass it on to me. Um, and then social media, which ended up kind of landing me the job that I have right now. Um, so just to sort of paint a picture of how I got my Wood Green job. Um, so I'm the manager of public affairs with Wood Green and I um, just sort of happened on the posting, the LinkedIn posting in a Facebook group that I'm a part of that a friend of mine created. Uh, she posted the uh, job um, as she was connected with the employer and I just sort of did a cold call, you know, shot my shot, I guess, and um, uh, connected with her on LinkedIn and just asked for an informational chat. Um, and she, you know, one thing led to another, I applied for the job and I got it. Um, easier said than done. <laughs> um, but, you know, one thing that I would um, kind of taking a bit of Ikenna's um, words of the foundation of my career, I would say is definitely passion and um, pursuing your passions helps to expand your networks, which helps to expand your opportunities. And, you know, two core passions of mine that I've found have totally been interwoven into my current job with Wood Green is community engagement and strategy building. And um, one avenue that I've been able to pursue my passions has been through my volunteering. So uh, the Canadian Black Policy Network is a policy forum that um, has recently been founded and launched to um, connect Black policy professionals and community leaders to uh, innovate, collaborate, and push forward on policy issues affecting uh, Canada's Black communities. Um, and this is an initiative that actually stemmed all the way back into my time doing my Master of Public Policy degree at, at the University of Toronto. Um, but honestly, it really just boiled down to my eagerness to support my community and push for um, changes in uh, the system that I felt were important to make. Um, and, you know, I gained a lot of experiences from this volunteer work and from launching this network that I was able to feed into my application, my resume, and my interview for the Wood Green role, and which I'm also now feeding into my role with Wood Green. Um, in case uh, for folks who might not be familiar with Wood Green Community Services, we're one of the largest social services agencies in Toronto. We provide programming and support in various areas of affordable housing, senior youth and family care and employment services. And, you know, of course, following the onset of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, Wood Green has really had to pivot a lot of its services um, in a way where we've sort of interwoven and interlinked them to support the even more complex situations that a lot of our clients and um, communities are dealing with. And so in reality, a lot of what um, organizations like Wood Green will need to do in order to continue to thrive during and well beyond this pandemic is developing strategic approaches to our programming and service delivery in order to maintain our resources to continue to serve the communities that we you know, are working to serve. And so my job with um, 
the Vintastic Policy and Strategy team that I'm a part of is to support the development of those strategic approaches to program and service delivery internally, as well as enhancing the exposure of that programming and services externally to ensure that we continue to meet our goals and continue to um, service the communities that we're dedicated to. So, you know, it's kind of my career is definitely not following along a linear trajectory. It's kind of, you know, like a bit of a roller coaster, but it's fun regardless. Um, but it's, you know, at the same time, just that main goal of pursuing what interests me because I'm someone who gets bored pretty quickly. <laughs> so when I work, I have to ensure that I am committed to the work and interested in it. And so following my passion has really allowed me to kind of like, you know, enjoy what I do as I followed my course in my career. Thanks, Anna Kay. That's, that's super interesting. Again, it's about, you know, I love seeing how the similar themes emerge across all the different panelists about bringing your whole self to work and, and being passionate about what you do. I wanted to now turn it over to Victoria. Um, so Victoria, you've clearly demonstrated that transferable skills are valuable. You've worked in community engagement. Uh, you've worked in reducing barriers to voting. And now you're working to build up the Public Policy Forum's membership base through events and conference sponsorship. We'd love to hear how, how you made that leap. Yeah, so thank you so much for your thoughtful question and I'll do my best to answer it. Uh, you know, in essence, I built my career around being a relationship builder through the lens of social policy. So in that regard, all the roles I've held are actually the same when you look at the underlying structure. Uh, they're all about listening to the needs of the partners I'm working with and in each organization, it's been for connected but unique purposes. Uh, I've always been driven by dynamic work and striving to connect with people and organizations. So really, it's about recognizing that I could apply my skill set in different capacities because the work is about demonstrating, you know, how the interests and goals of the partners I'm working with align with the value proposition of my organization. It's about identifying opportunities and making genuine connections. So in my case specifically, I was intrigued uh, by the idea of, um, sorry. I was intrigued by the idea of helping people bridge the gap between community voices and leadership, and specifically helping public policy forum engage emerging and ascending voices to broaden the talent pool they engage with for their projects, in addition to the business development work in my portfolio. I think we can all agree that policy making uh, all too often happens in elite spaces, and uh, that's why you know PPF is committed to uh, more inclusive policy recommendations, and that's why my skill set and my identity as a woman of color was a valued addition. So with all of that in mind, uh, I wanted to give you guys five really actionable and concrete pieces of advice, because sometimes these conversations can be a little abstract, although not today, I'm finding. So I wanna use plain language and give clear advice on developing transferable skill sets that will equip all of you for the future of work. So number one is make a skills map. As you start to build your skill sets, knowledge, education, and work experience, keep track of it in real time. I've kept a list of my skills as I'm developing them. If you're struggling to start, then look at your job description and ask for a one-on-one -on -one with your supervisor. This is also a good opportunity to check in with them about what skills they value currently and what skills they recommend building in the future. One tip I have is to focus on being an excellent writer. That might seem simple, but it's rarer than you think and it's highly valued. Number two is micro-credentialize. Um, and what I mean by this is to be a continuous learner, both formally and informally. Future proofing yourself means understanding and accepting that your skill set is going to need to constantly evolve. It'll make you more marketable if you continue to ask yourself what is interesting and what is relevant in your industry and commit yourself to learning those trends. If you can show employers that you have a readiness to learn, it goes a really long way. And I realized that acquiring additional degrees and certifications can be financially difficult. So my advice is to explore and make use of the many free and lower cost learning opportunities out there, including like general assembly workshops. I know that Microsoft has some opportunities to micro credentialize like with their accessibility badge and uh, specifically a public policy forum. We have the public policy leadership program, uh, which happens in uh, partnership with the Telfer School of Management and also the digital innovation hub at the Toronto Reference Library is like simply amazing as well. Um, finally, there's a ton of great reports like the one Yasmin took us through today that our think tanks are putting out. This is a great place to continue your learning as well. And I know it sounds like a lot of work, but one, <laughs> one hack I have is to copy and paste reports into a Word document and they can read, you know, Word can read it out loud to you so that you can passively take in the information while you're working or cleaning or doing whatever else. Um, number three is understand the ecosystem you're working in. 
if you understand the essence and the orientation of your organization, that is a great thing. And so then you can recognize what you can do in your capacity to help. Everything you do should be in service of that purpose and working cooperatively with your colleagues to get there. And if your organization is in support of this, be willing to do more than what's listed in your job application. This gives you an opportunity to grow and learn new skills, as well as illustrate your ability to be worthy of more responsibility. And especially during slower economic times like these, when there aren't as many um, obvious opportunities for advancement. Next one is have a network of mentors. One mentor is necessary, but a network of mentors offers diversity of thought perspective and can direct you to potential opportunities. I have three mentors and they've all been excellent advisors and they've shared the things with me that I didn't know about or realize I was qualified for. I credit them with helping me realize that I actually had transferable skills. And the last one is what you're doing right now. Continue to network, but do it in an authentic way or else it might not work. Um, place yourself in the environments you want to be in. I volunteered my way into this industry. I started by volunteering at the Samara Center for Democracy. I was the first vote pop-up volunteer. That led to my job at Elections Ontario doing democratic engagement for the province. And that led me to the Public Policy Forum. I actually ended up sitting next to my current supervisor, Masha Kennedy, at a Mass LBP event on deliberative democracy, something I was already interested in and working on. So it was very natural. I know it can be intimidating, but there will be friendly faces there to share ideas at these events. I will be one of those friendly faces if we meet at a future event or in the networking, you know, uh, segment of this later on. And I know that during COVID, this is harder to do, of course, but you're in the right place by being here and taking part in these virtual net networking sessions at the end of the panel. So that's it. Thank you, Victoria. That's fantastic. Super practical, tactical advice. I really like that. I wonder if you wouldn't mind posting those five, uh, five points in the chat for the, for the rest. Absolutely. That would be fantastic. I want to turn it over a little bit now uh, and ask a more general question. So uh, I want, uh, maybe we'll start this question with Yasmin, Justin, and Anna Kay, and then the rest of you can do the next one. But um, can you speak to different approaches you've taken when looking for opportunities? So where I'm coming from here is that there's a widely held sentiment uh, by many whom don't have expansive networks that there's no point in applying to a job at an organization where you know no one. What are your thoughts on this and, and, and what are your approaches to, to looking for opportunities? So maybe we'll start with Yasmin, then Justin, then Anna Kay. Uh, yeah, happy to go. Um, I think right now what Victoria just mentioned is, is really useful. Um, for me, I've always had like this bug to like volunteer um, since I was really young. I think I remember being like in middle school and like volunteering. And I, I think in high school, the hours were like, um, to be able to graduate in Ontario, you need to have, I think, 50 hours of volunteering. I think I did over a thousand. Um, so I've definitely just been like so keen in my entire life, <laughs> which I, I think it helps, right? People want to see that enthusiasm and that um, you're going out there and really giving it all your all. Um, and I, I think this part around networking is, is a really interesting question. I came to this country as a refugee, so I don't have a lot of um, uh, networks that my parents or my family or family friends I could kind of tap into, right? And I know that's a lot of struggle that, uh, the same kind of struggle that a lot of people have. Um, so what I recommend again is like volunteer as early as you can. Um, I volunteered when I was like in high school and that gave me so much like, um, like access to connections to people to kind of um, build up um, my experience there. And then I also realized that volunteering is difficult, right? Like everybody, not everybody has the time to volunteer. Um, I started working full time, I think in my third year of undergrad because I had to pay bills, right? And I know that a lot of people are in, are in situations like that um, as well. Um, so I, I recognize that it's not always the solution, but what can also be helpful, like I think Victoria also mentioned, is like try to see what transferable skills you have and even if it's, um, and, and try to reach out to people as well. Um, I found that, that um, most people, if you ask them for a coffee chat, they'll say yes. And I'm sure like most people on this panel will say yes to you as well. Um, like don't be afraid to kind of do like a cold call, right? Or cold email or cold like LinkedIn um, ask, right? If, if you send it out to 10 people and only two people get back to you. You have two solid leads now, right? Um, and I've, I've often found that um, when I'm doing coffee chats, sometimes I can't necessarily help the person themselves um, because I maybe I'm not in their sector or maybe I don't have like a job that comes immediately to mind. But I, I definitely always refer them to someone else that I think can help them. And it's kind of like that snowball approach. And um, eventually they'll like end up with someone that can actually connect them to a job, right? And it, it may take a little while, but 
I think, I, again, like being persistent really helps. Thanks, Yasmin. What about you, Justin? What, do you, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, no, um, I think that that all makes sense. I mean, uh, one point I want to make for, for folks who are sort of um, thinking about not applying to see a job that you're interested in and, and then self-selecting out, I think like just strongly encouraging folks to, to not do that. Um, worst case scenario, you don't get the job. You know, you, if you don't already have the job, you're not, you're not missing out. And, and I, in particular, you know, I really want to like hammer this, this message home, particularly for women, for non-binary folks and for, for BIPOC folks across the board is like, I have had so many conversations um, with, with particularly women of color and um, non-binary folks who just like, will say, well, I'm not qualified. I'm not going to apply for this. Like, and, and I'm always like, just apply, just apply because I know someone else who is, way less qualified than you uh, who's going to apply and they're probably going to get the job. So I think just like whenever you have that like gut feeling of like, I don't know if I'm qualified, just like try to like, try to push that down and like power through and apply anyways, because worst case scenario, you, you get an interview, uh, you get some feedback if you don't get the job and that will kind of spiral and you might make a new connection out of it, you know? So I think that's, I think that's just so important for people is don't self-select out. Um, secondly, you know, I'll say this, like, um, networks and, and like sort of your social capital, like they do, they ultimately do really matter. Um, I know for many folks, I'm sure you kind of heard stories of that. Um, I know for me as well, sort of the, the jobs that I've, you know, landed have often been tied to, to people I know and connections I've made. So um, I think those things matter and, and they're important. Um, and, but, but similar in the way that Yasmin spoke about it, I think don't like, don't be afraid of, of cold calling. Don't be afraid of um, joining an event and reaching out to someone in the chat or, you know, doing a LinkedIn search and finding a connection. I have email exchanges, virtual coffee conversations before COVID, many in-person coffee conversations with folks and, and always happy to, to share and, and, and many folks are. And again, oftentimes I might not have the answer, but I know someone else who's sort of aligned with you. And it's, it's really about finding those entry points to building your, building your network. And so um, how you do that is you got to start somewhere. So you might as well start uh, you know, building a connection with someone and, and doing that in a sort of real and, and, and uh, sincere way, I think is important. Uh, and then maybe just lastly on that point is, is to also do a little bit of work to be prepared as well. You know, I think th that those conversations in my experience go a lot further when folks sort of have an understanding of, of maybe the work that I do or interested, they come with some questions and that sort of really sparks a, a real deep conversation. So um, do some of the background re research about the organization someone works for and, and connect with some clear questions about their work and uh, go from there. Thanks, Justin. That's great. What about you, NIK? Um, so firstly, just want to say, Justin, you literally spoke to my story. I actually didn't, um, I missed the deadline for my wood green roll that I currently have. Um, but I set up a coffee chat the day after the deadline with that employer. And in the call, she said, did you apply? And I was like, no. And she's like, apply for the job. I thought that I was unqualified. So totally resonate with exactly what you're saying. Um, I'm definitely gonna sound like a broken record here, but just like Yasmin was saying, um, just like Justin was saying, Victoria, volunteering, I think, you know, really helps you, as I mentioned earlier, expand your networks, which helps you expand your opportunities. You know, um, your social network, it will require time and energy to build, but if you do, the benefits will, you will reap the benefits later on, eventually. You know, it, it all com comes to fruition over time. Um, I uh, previously worked in corporate governance for two years, um, really other odd story of how I landed that job. But um, while I was working in that field, um, which is very different from where I'm right now, you know, community engagement, I was volunteering every afternoon, every evening, I would be involved with the Toronto Black Policy Conference, I would be involved with leading Change Canada, which is another organization I volunteer with in sustainability and youth. I would volunteer with the um, Civic Action Emerging Leaders Network, which is a great network for emerging leaders in the GTHA, the Toronto region. Um, highly recommend folks to get engaged with that. I'll post a link in the chat. Um, and, you know, all of these were ways for me to pursue my passions, as I said, and by doing that, though I, it was free work, I was still working and I was still building up my career by volunteering and by meeting these different people. And, you know, in the pandemic that we're in right now, a lot of people need support, need volunteers, and you would be surprised by how many people you can meet just by taking and sharing some of your time. So I would highly recommend that. And again, I really encourage you to volunteer because I think that the you'll reap the rewards down the line for sure. 
Thanks, Anna Kay. I, I just want to also add something here that I couldn't find a job and I finished graduate school as well. And I was a serial coffee chat person when we could do coffee chats in, in person. And I met people and I prepared for it. And I eventually ended up getting a job by finding it from a Facebook ad. So the other thing is definitely never, never self-select yourself out of something. And also lots of companies now, we are having these conversations, they're more in the mainstream and they're there are ways in which they try and make things more fair when you do apply for stuff. So take faith in that um, as well. But you know, this is just such, such, such great experiences here. Thank you. I want to just turn it over to the next question. And you know, this is the sort of overhang of everything we're dealing with right now. And that is COVID. And it's been a massive disruption. I know for my organization, it's been a massive disruption. It's been very difficult to handle. So I, I'm wondering if uh, I can and Victoria, um, how have your organizations adapted in recent months to, to COVID and, and Victoria specifically conferences and events that you've done with the PPF that must have had a big impact on your work. So what are some of the ways you've pivoted in your job currently? So maybe Victoria and then I can. Uh, great. So I have a two part answer to this question. So yes, COVID has been a huge disruption, not just to our organization, but to everyone. And as we see to some more disproportionately than others, including women, racialized people and other equity seeking groups. Um, in terms of our organization, you know, lots of think tanks have been going through a difficult time. And so we looked at every aspect of our business to ensure we were, we were remaining relevant, timely and contributing to helping and rebuilding Canada in terms of our policy recommendations, which are really at what's at the heart of our conferences. So we were able to pivot virtually. You know, you'll see all of our projects have a COVID lens because of the pandemic and because it's so pervasive and relevant to who PPF is and where we're going. You know, with that in mind, some of our research projects include skills for the post-pandemic world in partnership with the Diversity Institute and the Future Skills Center, as well as our flagship project, which is aptly named Rebuild Canada. You know, PPF really wants to do their part to harness the creativity and innovation um, throughout the country to rebuild a better Canada and to incorporate unheard voices into our work. Uh, you know, and that brings me to my second point on the racial pandemic we've been going through and really came to the fore in 2020. Diversity and inclusion is something all organizations need to be tackling head on and not only in this moment, but on an ongoing basis. You know, it's a constant process that never ends. And we know that policymaking has to be more inclusive and has to be informed by all levels of society. So, you know, not only is PPF building our products in a way that's more inclusive, but we're also doing work behind the scenes too. Uh, one thing I spearheaded was recognizing we're all coming to the conversation at a different starting point, um, which, which I think makes things more inclusive to everyone. And I knew that my colleagues and I all wanted to do better, but we needed some common ground to start with. So I led my colleagues at PPF in reading and discussing uh, Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist which I can't recommend enough because it offers, you know, a myriad of lenses to consider when building or connecting and really just how we can all confront our own conscious and unconscious biases. And, you know, finally, I also helped our CEO and supported him in his interview, recent interview with Minister Ahmed Hussein on his experience with anti-Black racism in Canada. You know, it's on our website now and I encourage everyone to take a listen. So the these are just a few ways we're doing the work and we'll be continuing to do so as well. And, you know, it's all of our responsibility to be strong allies, but not only that, but to professionalize, to strategize and to operationalize diversity and inclusion in our organizations. Thanks, Victoria. I think that's really good perspective. What about you, Akana? Uh, well, in, in our area, um, Treasury Board Secretary in the Ontario Public Service, um, you know, you know as it did with everyone, you know, COVID kind of, it was kind of like a dust of wind that uh, toppled over the House of Cards, you know, it uh, kind of forced us to change everything, you know, processes, systems, best practices, routines, life, everything overnight, you know, and, um, you know, we've all been, been faced with, you know, with the challenge, you know, how, how do we adjust you know, when we have to change the way we work and, and the way we live, because now the two are kind of one uh, in, in many cases. So fortunately, um, our team, uh, had remote work already baked into our infrastructure. So the transition from office to home was, uh, was fairly smooth. Um, the same can't be said for, for, for other areas of, of government. You know, the, the, the transition was a little slower, but fortunately for us, uh, some of our stakeholders and our partners um, in government um, 
you know, they, they had already had that process, those processes baked in as well. So communication was, was fairly uninterrupted. Uh, but there are, you know, certain variables missing, um, you know, especially when you're talking about uh, promoting like an inclusive culture, uh, which, which we do. Um, you know, just having those daily organic conversations with people, you know, the discourse that, uh, that kind of drives our culture, uh, especially within our division. Uh, you know, just having that immediate access to people, you know, getting to know people, you know, so you're talking about bringing your whole self to work. That's part of it, you know, um, being willing to hear someone else's story and being willing to, um, you know, learn of, of other people's experiences that happens um, when you're when you're able to have that immediate access and be face to face with individuals on a daily basis. Not to say it can't happen now, um, you know, but you know, it's, it's something that you kind of have to, you, you have to force the issue at this point. Um, you know, we, we had to ensure that we maintain regular connections, not just for work, but for, for our well-being. you know, in morning check-ins, you, you know, that, that was always, in, that's, that's always been encouraged, you know, because we also have to think about the mental health, you know, um, the isolation, you know, things of that nature. Um, I, I'm in a house with, with my family, so there's constant energy. You know, I got kids running around, my, my partner's on, the, on one side of the room, I'm on the other, we're both in meetings. And, you know, so, so, you know, I don't take that for granted because in some cases, some people might be, you know, by themselves um, 24 hours a day, especially earlier on in the, in, in the pandemic when people were highly encouraged to stay home and not go out at all. Um, you know, so I think it was very important for, for the, to have that interaction, uh, especially for some of the folks on our team that, uh, that were in that situation. Um, you know, and it's, uh, it wasn't necessarily about, you know, we, we don't always have, to, I don't, we don't always make it about work. You know, as I said before, it's, it's also personal, you know, because people kind of get stuck in that bubble. So um, it's, it's nice to, to kind of break out of that. Um, and so yeah, uh, you know that's, that's helped us. It's helped us with the transition. So just keeping that in mind, and we try to feed that into. Uh, we try to influence other other units, other divisions, other parts of government, other ministries as well. So yeah, it's 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 super interesting to see how your pivots in your career path also allow you to pivot your 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 roles, your businesses, your your, your organizations as well. I think yeah, the element of empathy is also something that comes to mind because you really have an insight into everyone's different circumstances at home and uh, and you know again I think you hit on that that really really well um, right there so this actually brings us to the end of uh, my questions for the panelists I just want to give everyone a chance uh, all you panelists a chance to um, any additional thoughts um, you'd like to give before we move to questions from the audience and then this also would be a nice opportunity I've seen a lot of chatter about this in the chat um, if there are opportunities, programs for recent grads or young professionals uh, in your sectors that you feel might be relevant to people, feel free to mention that here or in the chat. And just to keep things organized, why don't we go with Victoria, then Anna Kay, Ikenna, Justin, and then Yasmin. Victoria, okay, you? so I'll be brief. Um, so just a few things. First of all, I want to invite anyone to connect with me on LinkedIn because I'm always sharing these opportunities. The amazing thing about being a student is that there's so many programs oriented to help you get some work experience. So I want to call attention to the OPS summer student jobs, uh, the TD scholars program. And at our own organization, uh, this is more kind of, I think, for graduate students and a little bit more advanced, but like we said, don't self-select out. Uh, the Action Canada Fellowship Program. And as I think a few people are, are either current fellows or past fellows, but the diverse, uh, the Civic Action Diversity Fellows is an amazing one as well. So that's just a, a quick list. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, again, going back to the broken record of volunteering, <laughs> the Canadian Black Policy Network, um, as I mentioned, uh, recently launched and we're actually looking for a group of volunteers to uh, round out our inaugural executive committee. So we're looking for a corporate secretary, a director of finance, director of marketing and communications, director of programming and director of research and policy. So if anyone is interested in these roles, I'm going to post it in the chat and please do apply. And um, folks across Canada are welcome to apply. So, yeah. <laughs> so in the OPS, the Ontario Public Service, uh, we have the Ontario Internship Program, 
Uh, it's, a, it's a great program for young professionals uh, looking to get into government, uh, working policy. Um, you know, it's uh, recent graduates as well as those who are graduating. Uh, and uh, you know, several of those interns uh, have worked in, on our portfolios and, you know, they've had amazing opportunities to gain practical experience in areas of government that uh, they would otherwise have no access to. Right? And, and it really puts them in a great position to either stay in the OPS or move on to uh, greater things. Uh, so of the participants that I know, some, some have stayed on and uh, some moved on. Some moved on to, to some, some roles that even, even I would love to have at this point. But, uh, but yeah, on turn to OIP is uh, what they call it. I'll, I'll, I'll leave a link in the chat. Um, I have, I don't have any sort of additional, very specific, um, volunteer opportunities. So I think take everyone else up on theirs and, uh, yeah, there's definitely some great sort of like more youth oriented, like network organizations, I think to tackle into, like to tap into folks that just shared civic action, emerging leaderships, leaders network and, um, the GTA here, there's sort of similar type organizations in much, uh, in much of the country. So tapping into those, um, I guess for me, one, one sort of like last piece is, is to try to be open to the, the range of, of opportunities and possibilities that are out there. I think, um, you know, I think to be clear in your own sort of mind, uh, what, what sort of impact and what sort of change and what sort of work you want to, um, you're passionate about. And I think really about the impact and change that you want to have. Um, and recognize that there's plenty of different pathways and plenty of different jobs that you might find that will allow you to, um, to, to have that impact, right? I know for me, like I said, way back at the beginning of this, I didn't even know what philanthropy was. I didn't know it existed. Um, it wasn't a space that I had access to. Uh, I still don't fully understand it. Um, but it is, a, it is an avenue now that I've found uh, where I can make a change and have an impact. Um, it definitely wasn't the career I had uh, envisioned 10, 15 years ago. So I think just recognizing that there are many opportunities that will come your way, um, be open to those things and, and find your way to make an impact in the areas that you want to. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, I agree with everyone and everything everyone said here. I think um, I, I think I wrote this down in the group chat, but also like, is there a specific organization that you want to work at? Like I encourage you to go find whoever works there, particularly if maybe it's someone junior that you can reach out, maybe you would feel like less intimidated um, as well. Just reach out to them on LinkedIn and connect with them and see if there's volunteering opportunities. Cause it's a lot easier to make that transition to employment if you're already aware of that organization and what they do. And I, I think it's also like a last piece of advice. like. Um, um, I kind of mentioned the Ontario Internship Program. It's a program I applied to when I first um, graduated and I, I didn't, I was rejected, right? I didn't get into that program, but I still have a job now, right? Like, I, I think there's going to be lots of rejection throughout like this process as well. And it's, it's, it's hard not to give up, right? Like, I, I think I also like, I, as someone who's been on the job hunt, it's hard not to take the rejection as like a rejection of you as a person. And it's definitely like never that. Um, and like, I just encourage you to keep trying um, and, and reaching out to as many people as you can also. Thank you so much, panelists. Uh, fantastic perspective. Um, we're gonna now turn it over to questions from the audience. So to everyone listening, please use the Q&A function, not the chat to ask your questions. And you can direct questions to an individual speaker or the whole panel. And you will also be able to upvote questions when you see them. So if there's something that uh, really appeals to you, feel free to use that. Now, I'm just going to try and open it. All right, there we go. Um, um, I, I feel like I need to admit something. I, yes. I think I took the instruction well and I started answering the Q&As inside the Q&A. <laughs> just as an FYI for anyone looking for questions, there's also an answer tab you can look at. Aha, uh -huh. okay, that's good because we, were, we had plans to sort of move them over after the panelists had answered the questions, but I will look at that now. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. So the five skills again, I think Victoria, you've posted that already. So we can, we can leave that. Um, I will go to all the panelists. What is the best message you've received on LinkedIn or social media or email that make, made you more compelled to have a coffee chat with someone? So what works uh, to get your attention, I guess is the question. So uh, anyone feel free to jump in. I guess um, I can. Oh, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry, I feel like I've been speaking a lot, but I, I think for me what stands out is like, I, Hermosa, I think you mentioned this earlier, but someone who's done their research on your organization, so it's not like completely out of the left field, they understand 
um, what your organization does and potentially what you do as well. Um, so and maybe they can tie it in their own experience and their own background. And it doesn't always have to be super tied in. They're like, I'm interested in innovation policy because um, like I, I, I did a research project at school about it or like I'm interested to see how technology changes, right? Like have an understanding of what, um, sorry, I have an understanding of what they do. Um, also, maybe you can send them an article and be like, hey, I like saw this article and thought about you. So you're like, it's more of a, um, it's, it's more transactional, transactional, it's like more of a back and forth. Um, can I jump in or? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I would say um, one thing that I like and one thing that I feel I've encountered other folks liking when I've reached out to them as well is to approach it in a kind of human to human way. Like, I know that we all have asks and I know that at the end of the day, you know, your goal might be to connect with someone to hopefully get a job. But I think just approaching with a natural sense of curiosity and enthusiasm for, you know, definitely doing your background research on like what the person does, what their, you know, uh, work experience is like, but also kind of approaching the conversation in a, you know, just with a general sense of curiosity, because I've definitely experienced even rejection and networking with someone because they knew that my end goal was, you know, this or that, and they kind of sense that and turned off by it. So I think it's, it's, it requires a bit of a balance of both, you know, coming prepared with information and, you know, with your ask, but also approaching the person as a person as well. Cause at the end of the day, we all are just people. So hope that helps. Um, sorry, can I jump in? Go ahead, go ahead. There's, there's one person that comes to mind for me. I won't, I won't name names, but they, I, I've, I've worked with this person for, for years. Um, and it started by just a simple message on LinkedIn. And essentially what, what they did was they did their homework, uh, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, and they saw, they saw the gap in, in, in my organization. So when I was uh, heading up the agency, um, you know, there were, there were some gaps and we were still trying to fill things out. And this individual messaged me and was pretty straightforward in terms of what they were looking for and, and basically articulated what the value add, what their value add would be. Um, but they did it in a very kind of natural way. Um, and, I, and I have to say that he was, he was quite, he was quite persuasive and gifted in, in, in how he approached it. But I, but I think that it's an approach that everyone can take. It's just about doing the, doing the research, doing the homework. Um, and if you do a deep dive into the organization or into that area, or, you know, you, you can see where there might be opportunities. That's where you can create the opportunity for yourself in some cases. I think sometimes we talk about the, uh, the hidden job market where, where they say like maybe only 20 to 40% of jobs are at, of available jobs are actually posted. Well, the rest of them are out there and some of them, people may not even know that they need that until you, until you reach out. And I think um, if you're able to reach out with that intent, it might, it might help you in that, uh, that exchange. I really like that piece of advice. Sorry, go ahead, Victoria. Oh, sorry, I was gonna say, I just wanna echo uh, Akena's advice because you know I actually got my job at the Mars Discovery District because I just reached out to someone who was working there um, they had nothing posted and I had no expectation, but through, you know, the conversations we had and, and how I could show, you know, what value I would add, I actually had like a contract uh, position created for me. So, you know, don't wait for the listings, absolutely do the connecting. Do the connecting and the research. I think um, we're going to move on to the next question just because it's directed at Justin, so I won't give you an answer, to, uh, a chance to answer the, this one. Um, it's, it's similar to what we asked you earlier, but maybe people would like you to expand on it a little bit more about how you transition from one field to another, because you have really gone from very, very different spaces um, throughout your career. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if it was as always as with such intention to move into the specific field. Uh, I think it was, it's, it's sort of tied more back to what I just shared around um, seeing different opportunities to, to sort of make the change and have the impact that I was hoping to have. So, I mean, I think there's the practical side. How did I actually do it? I, I really sort of, um, I reflected and understood the, the skills and the assets that I had and, and really sort of looked at how they would apply in different circumstances and different situations, right? So when I, when I talked about, you know, being a teacher and I still draw on this experience all the time, like what I did was, you know, I, I facilitated, I mean, I facilitated a group of, you know, 
grade 11 students, that's just as hard as facilitating a group of business leaders or, you know, a range of folks. And so I, I tend to host and facilitate a lot of conversations with a range of stakeholders, with partners all the time. So that skill that I had sort of built and honed in the context of, of teaching is something I, I draw on and utilize in all of the work that I do now, you know, two careers later. Um, so I think it's that piece is really sort of understanding and thinking through what are your what are the skills and the experiences that you have both I think professionally and Yasmin spoke to this really well at the beginning your own lived experience as well are really critical always so we can't forget about those experiences those matter um, just as much and so but to really understand how those things kind of be utilized and apply in different circumstances and come up with examples and really think it through when you're thinking about transitioning to different careers so that, that's what I would say is sort of on the practical side um, but ultimately what what motivated the different uh, the different like the different careers was more about opportunities that kind of presented themselves for me to um, make the sort of change and impact that I wanted to. That's great. Yeah, very, very relevant to the sort of findings of the Brookfield report as well. Just uh, understanding what works and, and being able to bring your full self to work, which, you know, hopefully workplaces actually encourage that. Um, the next question is also to all the panelists. So what if you've been doing all these things, networking, coffee chats, volunteering, et cetera, and you're still unable to find opportunities? I've had a few years of experience and contacts within organizations, and yet I'm still unable to get response emails when I apply for a job. That's definitely a difficult situation. I think one that a lot of people find themselves in. Um, who'd like to take a stab at answering that? I feel bad on calling on people, but Victoria is unmuted yeah, as well. I can start. So, why don't we... so first of all, I just I just want to empathize with how difficult that is and how it can absolutely lead to feelings of you know hopelessness, especially given you know not only the current climate but just kind of the the talk around jobs for the past few years. Uh, you know, my advice is probably to if you can, like, uh, try and engage a career coach. Um, I know that, again, that some of these things are financially difficult, but there are different entry points. Sometimes your places of work or there might be some funding to, you know, kind of get some education. So that might be something that you can do. I would also say, like, you know, try and come out to more things like this where there's networking opportunities and you can actually talk to people one-to-one -one. that doesn't actually rely on them responding to an email. And uh, number three, I would say as much as it feels personal, honestly, it feels personal to me when people don't respond to my emails. Um, sometimes it's not personal at all. Like, you know, everybody's kind of working over capacity and sometimes these things slip. I would say don't feel bad about reminding them at all. I would say even up to twice because I think genuinely people are good and they do want to respond to you, but just sometimes that to-do list, you know, just piles up so high. But that being said, like they do have a responsibility to respond to you as well. Uh, you know, like that's just part of what being a leader and what the cost of leadership is. So I would say ultimately, if you're reaching out to someone and they're not responding over and over, do you want to work for that person? That's, that's genuinely what I think. So um, you can reach out to me if you want, and I'll be happy to share some, some practices and some tips, and I'll promise to respond to you. I, I can jump in and, and, uh, uh, and Angelo, I might be mispronouncing your name, but I think you just provided a little bit more context in, in the chat to it. So uh, I'm not an HR person, so I don't know if there's anyone who's, who has like HR specific experience. So I don't know if this is actually true. Um, but uh, I, I've heard, because uh, you're talking specifically about getting to the interview phase and having challenges sort of making that transition from applying to actually getting an interview. Um, so I think, you know, in, in, and that comes back a lot to like the, the social networks and stuff like that, which matters and all of that pieces. But, but it, then there's also the sort of very technical side of applying and, and um, making sure your sort of cover letter and resume and those sorts of things are really clearly aligned to the position. Um, so I think that's important. If you can, it, it, you, it, I don't know if you've tried this or not, but uh, potentially is also trying to reach out to other organizations that you've applied to, even if you didn't get an interview and ask if they can provide any feedback and trying to get that on, on a previous application, I think can be really helpful. Um, I know in certain contexts and, and depending on the type of organizations that you're looking to be employed by, you know, there, there is a growing component of um, uh, automation in the, in the, in the hiring aspects. So, depending on which sort of organizations and businesses you're applying for, um, you might just be getting screened out for, for a range of reasons. So that really comes back to like really tailoring um, the, the, the application to what the job description is and, and the thing and the, the job posting. Um, yeah, I don't have a ton of 
kind of clear other other examples and, and things than that but just want to also empathize and know like it's it's uh, it's challenging and it's it's hard and you know this is but but again just to echo um victoria's sentiments here like it's not uh and this only means so much coming from someone you don't know but it's it's not about you and and like it does impact your feelings of often your feelings of your yourself and your self-worth but but it's not about that um and so doing your best to sort of not get down and not get caught up on that and not making it about you personally because that's that's really not what it is um but yeah I, I have one quick addition as well um so I didn't really use this technique with my most recent job application period but uh the last time I was applying for jobs I would definitely apply to the job and then find the employer if I could on LinkedIn and follow up with a message to them connecting and saying hey I just applied for this job really eager for it you know, um, hope to hear from you soon. And, you know, I found that for those jobs that I did apply to and then followed up with a like connection message on LinkedIn with the employer, I did get a response back more so for those jobs and the ones that I didn't actually try to seek out, you know, a, a closer connection with the employer to. And just another uh, tidbit I would add to is, um, I'm not sure, I didn't see in your question uh, that you mentioned uh, connecting with mentors or building sort of like a mentorship, but I think having a mentor or having someone who can sponsor you and speak on your behalf that might in a position be, be in a position of leadership or be in a position of um, more experience in the work um, in their career, um, having them, you know, be able to advise you um, with any sort of advice on how to navigate your career, how to access opportunities that you can't or networks that you can't, I think is really great. And it's also just an additional cheerleader in your corner. So um, I think Victoria had mentioned it earlier and I totally echo that sentiment of looking out for mentors, literally just asking somebody like, you know, if who you know, of course, you know, could you be my mentor? Could you help me and mentor me? And hopefully they'll respond yes. Uh, I just want to be uh, cognizant of time and answer one more question. Just, just one thing to add that you can, uh, you can reach out to people you know, you can also reach out to people you don't know as a mentor, because I did that at one point in time, because I didn't have a very big network when I moved here. And um, I found people whose career I found interesting and wrote to them and asked them if they had time to talk me through a few things and help me decide on a few factors, especially since I didn't have the kind of support that I um, thought I would have, you know, in my personal life, et cetera, for these kind of things. Um, I think one of the interesting questions here, and we've just got a few minutes left. So any recommendations of how to volunteer within you know, within our passions uh, during COVID, because that's clearly a reality we're going to live with for a little while longer. So, uh, who'd like to take a stab at that? Just a few, just a few of you, uh, if possible, because we have only about two minutes to go. Um, um, I would say. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think I think there's there's an, there's an underlying theme here, um, and it's it's volunteering. You know, and I think you know the. You know, reaching out to individuals through, say, social media, I think that's really, I think it's really important. It's a really important skill to have, you know, just being comfortable with that, even though it, it may feel awkward or it may feel like you're out of your depth. But I think it's really important to do so because now more than, I think more, now more so than ever, you know, people are looking for other ways to find to find that talent and to find people to volunteer for the organizations. I know in our situation, like we were, you know, we were in a similar situation where we were trying to figure out how we could, how we could find talent, um, how we can expand the talent pool um, at this time. And um, I think when people reach out directly, it just makes it a little easier. It's very hard for an employer to, to catch everyone, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not possible. So sometimes when you just put yourself forward, um, those opportunities kind of open themselves up. And I think, uh, I think it's been mentioned before, you know, you, you know, you just have to, you do the, do the research yourself and, uh, you know, find the, the organizations um, or areas uh, of interest. Uh, and, and you just, you know, you look into it yourself and you just, you know, connect, you know, um, whether it's, reaching out to me on, on LinkedIn or something like that, or any of the other panelists or anyone that, uh, that, that you feel might lead you down that path um, to where you might be able to get a volunteer position. Thanks, Akena. Uh, Anna Kay, so you were trying to jump in earlier. Would you like to add a couple of last minute, last comments, and then uh, we can move it along after that? 
Yeah, I just um, totally echo what I kind of said, um, you know, really kind of just go using Google or um, any folks that you are already connected with. And um, also, yeah, making that ask with organizations that have piqued your interest that you're not sure if they are hiring or do have volunteer opportunities, still just, you know, contact them at their info at email or whatever, um, and just sort of seeking out those opportunities. But also, um, as I mentioned earlier, we are in the middle of a pandemic and a lot of organizations are struggling to stay afloat and can really benefit from um, support from the community. So I think if you kind of um, maybe change your uh, approach to searching, you might actually come across a lot of opportunities from organizations that do are very much in need. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, actually, we draw the panel to a close. I want to say thank you to the panelists. Uh, what a fantastic group of people, really interesting life experiences, interesting careers. You were so gracious with your time and sharing your experiences with us today. So thank you so much.